Hello, my name is Lisa Williams, and I'm the Associate Curator at the New Britain Museum of American Art. I am pleased to present today on three remarkable 19th century artists, Robert S. Duncanson, Charles Ethan Porter, and Henry Osawa Tanner, and their works at the New Britain Museum of American Art. This presentation will explore the tremendous success these artists achieved during their lifetimes, and how they contributed to and advanced American art despite the obstacles they faced living during antebellum and Civil War America. It will also address how posthumously they nearly fell into obscurity, but have been the subject of revived appreciation in more recent years through new scholarship and exhibitions. We hope that talks like these, now during Black History Month, as well as throughout the year, expand our understanding and appreciation for these artists so that their stories are prominently celebrated in the narrative of American art and history. The NBMAA is proud to represent the work of many visionary artists of Black and African American descent in our galleries and exhibitions, spanning the 1800s to today. Contemporary artists have access to myriad educational and career opportunities that their historical predecessors could only dream of. And it is for that reason that today's talk focuses on three historical figures whose successes are particularly noteworthy given the lack of opportunities that were readily available and the obstacles that aspiring artists of color faced in the 1800s. Before delving into their individual stories, I'd like to touch on the common grounds that Robert S. Duncanson, Charles Ethan Porter, and Henry Osawa Tanner shared in their experiences and art. The artists were all born within 30 years of one another. And while they may not have had contact during their lifetimes, each pioneered new territory for generations of artists to come. Each artist was of African American descent and born free in the years before the Civil War into modest circumstances. Each was driven by vision, ambition, and talent to overcome limited opportunities for aspiring artists to obtain a traditional academic arts education, to travel to Europe to expand their portfolios and resumes, to gain support from acclaimed artists and collectors, to receive laudatory press, both nationally and internationally, and to be represented in the most highly respected museums. Each became renowned for their contributions to distinct genres of art, Duncanson for landscapes associated with the Hudson River School, Porter for still lifes of abundant fruit and flowers, Tanner for religious and genre scenes that fused realism and impressionism. Additionally, each artist maintained success because of their versatility, receiving commissions for portrait paintings, murals, and even photographs. In their works, each artist employed meticulous care and detail, rich colors, fluid brushwork, and sophisticated spatial effects in romantic and naturalistic depictions of their immediate and imagined worlds. Each artist was devoted to exploring what it meant to be in America and an American in the late 1800s. Each was nearly forgotten in posthumous years, but are now fortunately the focus of renewed study and appreciation. Until recently, Robert S. Duncanson was not a household name, or at least not an artist as well known as some of his contemporaries from the Hudson River School. In January of 2021, however, his work made national news when his 1859 masterwork, Landscape with Rainbow, was loaned by the Smithsonian Art Museum as a gift to the new presidential administration. Great attention was given by press to the technical skill and beauty of the work as well as to the allegorical significance of a young couple who you see toward the lower left, strolling through fertile pasture land toward a house at the end of a rainbow, conveying a sense of promise and hope for the future. Something that was surely on Duncan's mind when he painted the work on the eve of the Civil War and 162 years later, the new presidents. Duncanson was, for many at the time, an incredible discovery, not an artist with whom even museum goers were necessarily familiar. But 
Just a cursory glance at his works reveals an, an artist of incredible vision, skill, and mastery, one who clearly deserves great esteem. Even prior to 2021, the New Britain Museum of American Art aspired to bring down his works to our galleries to reflect his story with that of other great American artists. And so it's with great delight that we're able to now do so in our current exhibition, Poetry of Nature, Hudson River School Landscapes from the New York Historical Society, a presentation of Hudson River School Masterworks curated by Dr. Linda Ferber. And while Poetry of Nature has traveled to numerous venues around the country, the NBMAA's presentation of the exhibition is the very first in which Duncanson's works have been featured, reflecting the NBMAA's desire to represent the diverse heritage of American art more inclusively. And while Duncanson's 1859 Landscape with Rainbow reflected pre-war, pre-Civil War hopes, these 1861 Italian landscapes featured in Poetry of Nature and painted at the start of the Civil War seem to convey a yearning for transcendence beyond the nation's conflict, division, and racial strife. So who was Robert S. Duncanson? And how did he come to paint such remarkable pastoral scenes imbued with calmness and serenity against the backdrop of national conflict? The grandson of an emancipated slave from Virginia, Duncanson was born a free man in New York in 1821. His father was a carpenter and house painter whose success allowed him to support his family and educate his children. Duncanson and his four brothers apprenticed in the family trades. And while his brothers achieved modest success, Duncanson emerged as the most talented of his siblings. And at age 16, he began his own painting and glazing business. Three years later, in 1840, he resolved to become an artist. And at age 19, he moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, the largest city in the West. He was primarily attracted to Cincinnati for its strong arts community. In the 1800s, Cincinnati was referred to as the Athens of the West and the Emporium of the West by its free black population who had much greater access to opportunities of advancement there than in other parts of antebellum America, given that it was a free state with strong abolitionist support. Here is Duncanson's 1850 view of Cincinnati from Covington, Kentucky. I'll share a detail of the work, which reveals how populous the city was and depicts in the foreground, white and black figures traveling the same path. It was during his years in Cincinnati that Duncanson became part of a budding network of Black artists that represented one of the first real communities of African-American artists in America. And while Duncanson had no formal art education, he taught himself through the widely accepted practice of copying prints and engravings of European masterworks, sketching from nature, and working as an itinerant portrait paper, painter. His earliest dated work is his 1841 portrait of a mother and daughter. By the next year, several of his portraits were exhibited at the Cincinnati Academy of Fine Art. This exposure led to favorable press as well as several commissions, including an 1848 landscape of Cliff Mine Lake Superior, commissioned by Charles Avery, who after profiting from the cotton industry, helped slaves escape the South using the Underground Railroad. An even more ambitious commission was a glorious series of eight murals at the Belmont residence of abolitionist and horticulturalist Nicholas Longworth, completed between 1850 and 1852. These works led Duncanson to pursue landscape painting in earnest, and along with two other Cincinnati artists, the now well-known Worthington Whitridge and William Luth Sontag, represented here in these works at the NBMAA, Duncanson became inspired by the Hudson River School artists, foremost Thomas Cole, and aspired to paint the American landscape. 
Together, the three artists set out on sketching trips around the country, transforming their sketched studies into romantic landscapes that captured an American paradise. In 1853, drawing from his commission earnings, Duncanson embarked on his first European trip together with William Sontag to view classic artworks that were deemed necessary for one's artistic education. Over the course of the year, he visited England, France, and Italy, and was especially attracted to the landscapes of Claude Lorraine and J.M.W. Turner. Remarkably, Duncanson is thought to be the first African-American artist to make such a grand tour voyage. After his return to the States, and as the Civil War broke out in 1861, he again traveled north to Canada and remained largely in Europe through 1866. It was as if he undertook a self-imposed exile during the years of the Civil War. Upon his return to the US in 1867, Duncanson exhibited works from his travels, like his Italian landscapes, featuring exotic ruins of classical civilization. By all accounts, Duncanson's career was flourishing and his paintings commanded up to $500 each, a very high sum for the time. Sadly, near the height of his career, he suffered a mental breakdown. And after being hospitalized for three months, he died in December of 1872. Duncanson's artistic achievements and contributions are profound. Today, we are struck by his resolve and his love for landscape painting. In an 1854 letter to a friend, he noted, of all the landscapes I saw in Europe, and I saw thousands, I do not feel discouraged. Duncanson was the first African-American to garner international acclaim, and the Cincinnati Press called him the best landscape painter in the West in 1861. Even though Duncanson's work had a loyal following among patrons, artists, and critics alike, he was nearly forgotten until the 1970s when a survey of his work was presented by the Cincinnati Art Museum on the centennial of his death in 1972. Duncanson's serene paintings offer a powerful statement about the determination of a free man of color, the grandson of a slave, to contribute to the conversation about the identity of America in the turbulent Civil War years. In 1987, curator and scholar David C. Driscoll noted that it was in still life painting that Charles Ethan Porter joined the ranks of artists including Robert S. Duncanson and Henry Osawa Tanner by depicting with equal skill the arrangement of flowers and fruits. Although Porter was born in the same era as these artists, Driscoll notes, his art had not received the same critical attention and his relative obscurity and re until recent years was perhaps due in part to the fact that his work had little exposure outside of Massachusetts and Connecticut, where he lived during his most productive years. It is also due in part to the fact that he, like Duncanson and Tanner, experienced racial prejudice in their day. Artists of color were often neglected because of their race and were more often rebuffed when they tried to exhibit their work. There now has occurred a, occurred a lively interest in the life and work of Charles Ethan Porter and this healthy revival of interest, though long overdue, will add immeasurably to our appreciation and understanding of the role that artists of African ancestry have played in American art. As if in answer to Driscoll's 1987 call for greater appreciation of Porter's work, the New Britain Museum of American Art organized a major traveling exhibition of Porter's works in 2008, curated by former University of Connecticut art historian Hildegard Cummings. Featuring over 40 of Porter's still life paintings and flowers, insects, fruits, landscapes, and portraits, the landmark exhibition traveled to multiple venues and, along with an accompanying catalog, introduced new audiences to Porter's lush, bountiful still lifes, which were painted in the years before and after the Civil War. The New Britain Museum of American Art retains in its collection two quintessential works by the artist. 
peonies from 1885, which is currently on view, and an undated depiction of mountain laurels, the state flower of Connecticut, which was Porter's birthplace and a powerful muse. Just as Robert S. Duncanson had become a preeminent American landscape painter during his lifetime, Porter became recognized as one of the leading still life painters of his era, whose works were characterized by meticulous realism, delicate brushwork, and richly nuanced colors. He was born to a free African-American family in Rockville, Connecticut in 1847. And although well-connected in the New England abolitionist community, his family endured poverty and tragedy. Porter lost seven of his siblings to illness and one to war in just 10 years, between 1858 and 1868. Self-determined from an early age, nonetheless, Porter was the first in his family to attend high school. He saved money from odd, odd jobs, and at the age of 21, he left to study painting in Wilbraham, Massachusetts. After two years of courses, and following the end of Civil War in 1869, Porter, boldly enrolled in the National Academy of Design in New York City and representing a historic watershed moment, became the first African-American admitted into the prestigious school. During his four years there, he studied alongside Julian Alden Weir and Albert Pinkham Ryder, whose works can also be found at the NBMAA. While at the school, Porter began exhibiting and was one of eight students given favorable mention by the New York Times. After his studies in 1878, Porter established a studio in Hartford, Connecticut, where his traditional academic art education made him a standout. Here we can see his studio on Main Street in downtown Hartford and an image of Porter with students. Porter did well in the city. His fruit and flower paintings, like those shown here, were purchased by area collectors. Local resident Mark Twain bought Porter's work and hung it prominently in his dining room. In 1879, Hartford-born landscape painter Frederick, Frederick Edwin Church visited his studio, acquired several paintings, and declared Porter to have no superior as a colorist in the United States. Porter succeeded well enough in Hartford to fund a trip to Europe. And in early November, 1881, he departed for an excursion to London and Paris with letters of introduction from some of Hartford's most prominent citizens, including Mark Twain. Fiercely determined and buoyed by community support, Porter took the intrepid step of enrolling at the Academy Julian in Paris where he studied with some of the most globally prominent artists of the time. Porter was probably the first African-American to undertake such a venture, an effort that required great expense, homesickness, and social alienation. As an African-American and devout Methodist, Porter struggled to integrate into Parisian society. Although far more tolerant than the US, artistic circles in Paris were still hardly diverse as suggested by this rather impressive but intimidating image of a class at the Academy Julian. Porter wrote to Twain from Paris in 1883 saying, I am aware that there are a goodly number of my Hartford friends and others who are anxious to see how the colored artist will make out. But this is not the motive which impresses me. There is something of more importance the colored people, my people, as a race I am interested in. And my success will only add to others who have already shown wherein they are capable the same as other men. In 1884, Porter returned to Hartford where he introduced his impressionist inspired new work influenced by the art he experienced abroad, which defied the more traditional established aesthetic aesthetics of the day. These still life paintings displayed looser brushwork and impressionistic style, color, and light. Perhaps nowhere better demonstrated than in the NBMAA's own 1885 peonies at top. For the next several years, Porter created some of his best work, combining technical virtuosity with sophisticated composition. 
But at the turn of the century, tastes began to change and Porter's academic style began to look increasingly old fashioned. Moreover, in the years immediately following the Civil War, African Americans experienced discriminatory backlash in both North and South, and Porter was no exception. By the 1910s, his prominent supporters had disappeared. His artworks failed to sell, and his predominantly white community no longer extended financial support. Porter sold his paintings for a pittance, or bartered many of them for sustenance. By the time of his death in 1923, he had been cast into obscurity, with many of his works in private holdings, unidentified or unaccounted for despite the success he had garnered during his lifetime and his accolades as a charter member of the Connecticut Academy of Fine Arts and an exhibitor at the National Academy of Design, American Society of Painters in Watercolor and the Hartford Decorative Arts Society. It would be nearly a century after his initial success before art historians and galleries began to re-examine the work of this talented still life painter and recognize Porter again as one of the country's outstanding 19th century artists. In fact, the only historical black artist to specialize in the still life genre. His legacy is an incredible body of work that centers, it centers its focus on the beauty and abundance of nature and our surroundings in even the smallest flower buds and fruits. Despite the pain, frustration, and anger that accompanied the Civil War era and the discrimination and disenfranchisement against the Black population, Porter devoted his life to documenting timeless and fragile beauty, which continues to radiate in his paintings today. Born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1859, a generation after Robert S. Duncanson and 12 years after Charles Ethan Porter, Henry Osawa Tanner came of age in the post-Civil War years of the Reconstruction era, a significant chapter in the history of civil rights in the U.S. in which slavery was abolished and freed men and women were extended equal rights under the Constitution, and yet racial division in America remained deeply entrenched. Tanner's parents were strong civil rights advocates, which accounts for Henry's middle name, Osawa, a tribute to the abolitionist John Brown of Osawatami, Kansas. His mother, Sarah Tanner, was a former slave who escaped Pittsburgh via the Underground Railroad. His father, Benjamin Tucker Tanner, was a college-educated teacher and minister. In 1864, Tanner's family settled in Philadelphia, where his earliest artistic interests developed. Throughout his teens, Tanner painted and drew constantly, and he took in visits to Philadelphia art galleries. His mother especially encouraged his artistic ambitions, and although many professional artists refused to accept an African-American apprentice, Tanner succeeded in enrolling in the prestigious Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia in 1879, becoming the only African-American out of 200 students. There, he became a favorite student of acclaimed teacher, Thomas Aikens, and made connections among other artists, including Robert Henry. Here we see a self-portrait by Thomas Aikens, as well as Aikens' painting of Tanner executed at the turn of the century. Tanner's career launched in 1880 when he was a student exhibiting in the Pennsylvania Academy Annual uh, and at the Progressive Workmen's Club in Philadelphia in the first exhibition ever of African-American artists organized by African-Americans. Although Tanner gained confidence as an artist and began to sell his work, he faced discrimination working as a professional artist in Philadelphia. In his biography, The Story of an Artist's Life, Tanner described the burden of racism. Quote, I was extremely timid and to be made to feel that I was not wanted, although in a place where I had every right to be. Even months afterwards caused me sometimes weeks of pain. Every time any one of these disagreeable incidents came into my mind, my heart sank and I was anew tortured by the thought of what I had endured. 
almost as much as the incident itself. Tanner persisted nonetheless, and he knew, as did so many late 19th century American artists, that for his career to advance, European study was required. Supported by the sale of his work, Tanner set sail for Europe in 1891, finding Paris a welcoming city, less encumbered by racial prejudice than the US. Here we have an image of his Parisian studio uh, that he obtained years later. Like Charles Ethan Porter before him, he enrolled at the Academy Julian. At the Louvre, he encountered and studied the works of Gustave Courbet and Jean-Baptiste Chardin, whose paintings of ordinary people in their environments, rendered in a realistic style, impacted the evolution of Tanner's own work. While he remained in France for the remainder of his life, in great part because of its racially tolerant climate, Turner did return briefly to the States in 1893 to spend a few months in Philadelphia. It was during this time that he created some of his most important works, which captured sympathetic depictions of African-American life to offset racist caricatures that were part of the American vernacular at that time. Among the works he produced were Banjo Lessons of 1893 and The Thankful Poor of 1894. It was only four years later that he produced the NBMAA's Wincoop House, Old Harlem. Although painted after his return to Paris, the work is reflective of Tanner's time in Philadelphia and his concerns with civil rights and themes that relate to Abraham Lincoln's 1863 Emancipation Proclamation, which promised freedom or birth and rebirth to black slaves. Unlike banjo lessons and the thankful poor, Wincoop House, at first glance, does not seem to focus on figurative subjects, but instead on a colonial home shaded by a large, a large tree. The home, located on the outskirts of Philadelphia, belonged to George Washington's abolitionist friend, Judge Henry Wincoop, who was said to have freed his slaves in the 1800s but whose treatment of them was said to be so kind that many of them remained on the property and upon their deaths, according to legend, were buried beneath the tree. In that sense, Tanner's serene composition becomes a powerful homage to Black and African-American slaves working toward freedom. Tanner enjoyed consistent acclaim in the final decades of his life. In 1900, his painting, Daniel in the Lion's Den, was awarded a silver medal at the Universal Exposition in Paris. The following year, it received a silver medal at the Pan American Exhibition in Buffalo. In 1910, Tanner was elected a member of the National Academy of Design in New York. In 1923, he was made an honorary chevalier of the Order of the Legion of Honor, France's highest honor. And in 1927, he became a full academician at the National Academy of Design, the first African-American to receive the honor. In his later years, Tanner was a symbol of hope and inspiration for African-American leaders and young black artists, many of whom visited him in Paris. On May 25th, 1937, Tanner died at his home in Paris. Today, the universal subject matter of his works, the international dimensions of his career, and his determination to prevail continue to provide inspiration to all. We hope that you will join us at the New Britain Museum of American Art to view these works and to continue to share the stories of these and other visionary artists of all colors. Thank you.